All right, fantastic. So last time we covered the zeroth law, we did a little tour of temperature. So now we're going to get into the first law of thermodynamics. We've got a lot of slides today, and we're going to go over the calculations for next week's lab to introduce some of the thermo, uh, the um, uh, calorimetry calculations and sort of the mindset behind it. It won't be exactly this. I mean, it'll sort of give you the principles of what we're trying to measure. We have three weeks of calorimetry, so I think it'll be fun. This is part of the um, lab experiences in this course that people really like. You get your hands on, you get to play around with some equipment. You get to, um, the setup for Monday or Wednesday's lab, depending on which one you're in, is um, actually kind of dangerous. So I want you to pay attention. <laughs> There's a place where two probes are plugged into the, the power thing uh, to measure the voltage, the line voltage, and you can see the metal. Okay, so don't put your finger there. <laughs> don't touch the live uh, electrically charged metal piece. It's like a half a centimeter. And so, yeah, I know you're like, don't do it. Yeah, so really don't do it. It probably won't kill you, but it'll hurt. <laughs> and so these are some basic thermodynamics terms that were at the end of last lecture. So I should have covered these. I'm gonna catch up on those. Um, and so we're dealing with heat most of this course especially all of the next three weeks in the lab. And so heat in this term, in this part of the course is Q. So I'm sorry, it's not the partition function anymore. It's, it's heat. So when you see Q, so the statistical thermodynamics is typically its own course. So there's really no ambiguity between Q and a stat thermal course and Q and a thermal course, because in a thermal course, Q is heat. But I always like to take the quantum and bring it into the bulk. And so I have that first section of this course as statistical thermodynamics. And so in the first, on the first exam, Q is partition function. <laughs> okay. The second, third, fourth, or whatever, it's not. It's the it's heat. Sorry. I, you know, once again, we um, we have that in the literature, and I don't want to change it and make this course an, an, an odd thing. Okay, so heat flowing in and out of the system is measured using temperature and heat flows through diathermal walls and not through adiabatic walls. So whenever you uh, hear the word adiabatic, the thing that should pop to mind is that there's no heat flow. It stops heat flow, adiabatic. And, and heat is a transactional number. So think about financial transactions, right? credit card or cash. Let me see. Yeah, probably credit card or cash. But let's let's do cash. Cash, I don't like cash because cash is also a thing that has value. Right? When your credit card purchase, it really doesn't have value. It's a transfer of value. Like a and Venmo too or Cash App, right? The value is in the bank. That's the energy but how the energy goes from one spot to another is the transaction and heat is a transaction. We're, we're measuring the transaction. Um, and so that's where we talk about flow. And so the transaction of heat, if it's an adiabatic transition, heat is zero. Okay. So that there's no heat transaction in an adiabatic process or through an adiabatic wall. So we can use heat to increase the system's capacity to do work. And that's the definition of energy system's capacity to do work. So even though this first law is about energy, a lot of times the measurable thing is work or the or or heat. So when the system changes chemically or otherwise, it can absorb heat, which we call endothermic, or release heat, which is exothermic. So you know those two words. And that ties that that heat Q to delta H. So delta H is Q, um, like a constant pressure process. So, so diathermic is heat conducting. And so good heat conductors are diamonds or diamond material, probably the best, metals, glass, and then any dense material. So if something's dense, it can transfer heat pretty well. <clears throat> now think about the diamond structure, do y'all can, you know, it's carbon, it's pure carbon. So the molecular structure of diamond, it's an infinite lattice of tetrahedral carbons bonded to other tetrahedral carbons. Think of how, how rigid that would be. 
So every diamond is held by four bonds at those 109.5 degree angles. And it, it really can't move or slide past any of the other atoms. It's locked in, in all directions. Super strong lattice. That's why diamond is so hard. And that's also why if you have a hot side of that diamond, the heat transfers very quickly through the carbon atoms to the other side. So diamond conducts heat better than, than any of these other things. So, so it would be nice, like in our saw blades, which undergo a lot of friction, the very tip of that saw blade can get real quickly up to 2000 degrees and soften the metal. Okay. And so if you, if your saw blades get too hot, the tips will round off. <laughs> the very tips will melt and then the saw blade gets dull. What if you took the sharp metal and you just sprinkled diamond dust, like, like glue diamond dust to the, to the sides of the tip? then the heat would flow down the diamond dust and keep the metals solid. And so it's, do we put diamond on the tips of saw blades? If we can, it's expensive, but on the tips of cutting tools, if we can, uh, not so much because they're hard, that helps. They don't get crashed, crushed, but uh, also because it sucks the heat away from the tip. So uh, what about insulating things? Well, good insulators, the best is a vacuum. <clears throat> Because if there's no molecules to carry the heat from side A to side B, then you can't get conductive heat. Like heat can't be conducted from one side to the other. You could still get radiative heat, like a hot side could emit infrared light over to the other side. But as far as conducting the heat from side to A to B, uh, vacuum is the best. And that's why our, our Yeti tumblers or Stanley tumblers, they have that double walled design. And that's called a Dewar flask or a Dewar thermos. You have a double walled container. I'll try to draw a crude one up here. It's a, it's a little Stanley, these gigantic Stanley cups that everybody's carrying around now. Okay. So inside here is the deal. It's got that big handle on it. Okay. So this inside here is a vacuum. I'll just point back into the inside here. Okay, so that's what keeps, if you got hot liquids in there, it keeps the, the heat from being conducted through the walls to the outside. If you got something cold in there, it keeps the heat from being conducted from the outside to the cold side. Um, and then you wanna keep it sealed so that hot molecules don't leave or hot air molecules get in and, and warm it up. So that's, that's how these thermoses work, but vacuum is the best. And uh, that's why they say, it keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold. It doesn't have to know though. <laughs> like there's no switch. Okay, keep it hot or keep it cold. It's just a vacuum. So then air is also good. Uh, foamed plastics, which trap a lot of air. And so this is like the Yeti ice chests. And then they have this, um, you know, any low density material can be put, put inside this, uh, this double walled box. Why didn't they put a vacuum in here? Well, because you're going to throw it in the back of your pickup truck and it's going to get punctured and then the vacuum is going to not be held. So that's no good. But again, to keep the hot air from coming in, it's got a really good seal here. So it's got a, a big, big plastic or a rubber gasket around. And that's, that's probably the thing that makes it um, last the longest. You know, you can put ice in a, in a Yeti cooler and it can last a really long time because it keeps the hot air from going in there and warming everything up. So that's an adiabatic wall. So the energy doesn't go through that wall in the form of heat. And so then you can keep a, a separation between those temperatures. You know, in this case, it shows that it's hot in the inside and cold on the outside. Okay, spun fibers like uh, fiberglass or cotton or, you know, thin nylon. Uh, so that's why our, our jackets um, are filled with that um, fiber fill or feathers <laughs> back in the day when you had goose down jackets. Good stuff, okay. Now this first law of thermodynamics, the internal energy of an isolated system is constant. That's the simplest way to say it. We call this in general, the law of conservation of energy. And we're gonna cover all of these topics in the next few lectures. Hey, welcome.
Right. Yeah. Really? <laughs> that's funny. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> You need to send the class some links, okay? <laughs> we definitely need to see that. Yes. And so this idea of this universe being, we're talking about isolated system. Let's talk about all the different system definitions. And so the one on the left is what we call an open system. So it's open and matter can be exchanged with the surroundings and so can energy. A closed system is just like what it, sound, it sounds like. We, we close it off to matter transfer. So that would be... Um, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've got a sealed container, so matter can't leave or come and go, but energy can go in and out. So a closed system can exchange energy, and so an isolated system is one that you can't exchange energy or matter. Okay. And so let's think about this as well, this, this idea of system and surroundings. So if, like, if we have cooling steam... The, the steam is the is the system. So this is the trick most of the time in thermodynamics is trying to get your mind around what is the system? What's the de definition? Most of the time when we write a chemical equation, that chemical equation is the system. Okay. Uh, this case, we don't really have a chemical equation. We have, say, a mole of steam. And it doesn't really have a container, but conceptually we can put a container around it. So if that mole of steam cools down, the heat leaves the steam and goes into the room, goes into the surroundings. Okay. And so when it cools down, it releases 1,870 joules. So this negative sign right here is showing that heat is lost to the surroundings. So the steam cools down, the surroundings warm up. Okay. And so we change the sign to compute the temperature rise of the surroundings. A lot of times you see this, this equation written and you don't think about that the Q system is negative. So you, a lot of times the students will, will mess up and drop that negative right there. Okay, so just always remember that one of these is negative, the other is positive. What we're showing here with this equation is that they're, they're equal magnitude but opposite sign, right? So if the system heat flow was negative 1870 then the surroundings was positive 1870 that's all we're saying don't make it over complicated but also don't drop that negative another statement of the first law that, that you know the energy of an isolated system is constant another way to say that is energy is neither created nor destroyed we showed with the fusion equation that we did miss some mass like we were missing mass when we did the fusion reaction and so that's why with Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, we now say mass energy is conserved. So it, mass can turn into energy or vice versa, but in general, mass energy as a unit is conserved in the universe. So energy is the system's capacity to do work. <clears throat> and the system gains energy when work is done on it. For example, winding a spring or compressing a, a gas. Uh, the system loses energy when it does work. For example, when the spring unwinds or does work, or when a compressed gas pushes on a piston, and we're going to look at some of those examples today of, of uh, expansion work. And the system can also gain or lose energy in the form of heat. A lot of times that's how we make the world run. We burn something, we get some sort of heat source, use the sun, whatever, and we're increasing this small system's ability to do work. So if we, if we burn gasoline and air inside a container, it can increase its capacity to do work and it can push that piston. And so that's how we're driving our vehicles. Work is the fundamental property in thermodynamics because it's measurable. We can, we can measure uh, you know, the motion, motion of the piston and so on. We can measure heat flow by using temperature changes, but in general, we're, we're measuring uh, uh, work most of the time. Okay, it's equivalent to moving an object against an opposing force, such as 
lifting a weight or expanding a gas against an external pressure or driving electrical current through a resistance. These are all examples of measurable ways uh, to uh, determine the work that was done. So we use the surroundings to decide. So disordered motion, we call heat or thermal motion. So if this system loses energy to the surroundings and we can't really see a systematic or, or orderly motion in the surroundings, we call that heat. Okay. But if we look at the surroundings and they're all moving in the same direction, we call that work. <laughs> right? So this might be a, a piston. So here the energy went in and we're moving this piston. Then we call that work. If this energy comes into the surroundings and then these atoms are just moving in all different random directions. We haven't captured anything. The energy was transferred, but we didn't capture it into a systematic motion. And so then it, we call it heat. And okay, sometimes we want heat. You know, we want to heat our water, we want to heat our homes, heat our bodies, right? Okay, that's fine. But, but a lot of times we want work. So heat can be the enemy of work. And we want to we want to get as much work out of a system as possible if we're trying to like push a piston or turn a wheel, then we want all work and no heat. But that's impossible. So we're gonna we're gonna have heat, but heat is that enemy of work. So you have an energy change, some of it's work, some of it's heat. Okay. And you can take the total energy change and you can take the work you got out of it and divide those two, and that's the efficiency. How much work you got by how much heat you put into the system. So our first law in action, the, the total change in energy is the change in the system and the change in the surroundings. And, and so the, um, the shortest version of the, the first law is that the, the total energy change is zero. So if we set those to zero, and, and if energy flows out of the system, it's gotta go into the surroundings and vice versa. So once again, like if this is positive, then this one is negative, right? We're taking that positive and we're changing the sign and we're getting a negative. So the, the, the heat flowing out of the system is going into the surroundings. Now without electrical work or chemical work or phase changes, then we, we sort of can exclude those for this part of the course. We're going to say, yeah, there's such thing as electrical work, like electrical motors or um, uh, you know, certain kinds of uh, chemical reactions that may provide or steal energy. Uh, phase changes can provide or steal energy as well. Um, but we'll set those aside and just talk about the expansion of gases, because that's how most of our engines work right now. Um, and when we get to the engines chapter, you'll see how a combustion engine works, how a turbine engine works, how all these different kinds of engines work on, on expansion work. So if we're dealing with expansion work, really all of these works will fit into this equation, but we're going to be fo focusing on expansion work. So the change in energy of the system is in two forms, kind of like I was saying, uh, Venmo or credit card. <laughs> okay, so one of these is heat. We'll, we'll, we'll say that's the credit card. And this one is Venmo. Oops, can't spell. Does everybody understand the analogy? There's two ways to transfer funds. There's two ways to change the energy of a system. You can do it by heat, you can do it by work. We want work. We don't want heat most of the time. <clears throat> so this internal energy, again, is that kinetic energy and potential energy, the molecules making up the system. It's a state function. And we will have a whole lecture on state functions where we'll actually get up and walk down the hall and have a little activity. Since it's a small enough class, we can do that. So be sure to come on that day when you see state functions. <laughs> okay. So the value doesn't depend upon how the system was, was prepared. And so our delta U can just be the final internal energy minus the initial internal energy. And that's a very important concept. It's good that internal energy is a state function. Heat and, and work can, can change the energy. So uh, we can set that final energy minus uh, internal ener uh, initial energy to 
heat and work and figure out like sometimes we will we will measure this one by using delta t and we might be able to use this one by um you know some other physical law and then and then so then we solve for q or other times we'll have q and we'll have delta t and then we have to solve for work you know so there's just a bunch of different ways of using these equations. So this is what makes this course confusing. So I'm trying to make sure it's as clear as possible. So let's move a piston. So we have our gas molecules in here and they're quite hot. And so they're bouncing off the walls of the container and hitting that piston. And there's an external pressure that is that is lower than the pressure on the inside and so it's pushing against that piston and it's sweeping it a distance of dz and the piston has an area of a so we can calculate that that a times dz and that gets the volume of which we've pushed so we've we've swept through a displacement volume and so when a piston of area of a moves against uh, through a distance dz it sweeps out this volume a times dz and the external pressure is equivalent to the weight pressing on the piston and that weight is the external is the the pressure which is newtons per area times area so we get newtons so that's the force okay and this is why we designate the displacement of volume in piston engines so you you think about your vehicle and I've got a, a Dodge Ram, I think it's a 5.7 liter. What does that 5.7 liter mean? Well, if you add up a displacement of all eight cylinders, it adds up to 5.7 liters, which is a lot, okay? That's why I can haul trailers and stuff. Luckily, it has an eight-speed transmission, so I still get 20 miles per gallon. A truck that size about 10 years ago would get 13, maybe. Yeah, with the with the towing differential, it might get seven or eight. So, twenty doesn't sound good to someone who gets thirty. It sounds great to the person that used to get thirteen. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> What's that? That's right. He's at the pump all the time. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. So we have this isobaric indicator diagram. So here's our first ISO vocabulary word. So isobaric. Okay, so that's, you need to, you need to internalize those words. Anytime you see like isotherm, isobar, iso core, or everything, this is isobaric indicator diagram. And what is, what do you think that means? Okay, no guesses. All right. So ISO means same, and bare bar is pressure. So same pressure all the way across the diagram. So it's a constant pressure. So an ISO bar is a constant pressure line. So you see this P external on the, on the pressure axis. It's a PV diagram. It's a straight line across. That's an ISO bar. Constant pressure. And this piston is sweeping out this volume from VF to VI. And so this is, this is the way we calculate the work. So the area under that indicator diagram is simple. The work done by this piston is the external pressure times delta V, which is the final volume minus the initial volume. Couldn't be easier. Okay. So we have expansion. When V final is greater than V initial, so that's the final is the larger volume, the initial is the smaller one, but then on compression, it's reversed. The final volume is the smaller volume, and so then the delta V is negative. Now let's look at the signs here. When, when we're expanding, let's see. Okay, here we are. For expansion, work is less than zero. It's negative. Okay, it's minus Px times delta V. If Vf is higher than Vn, Vi, and so we end up with a negative number for compression. Okay, we're right here. Work is greater than zero. 
it's a positive number. And again, this is all from the perspective of the system. What's the system? The system is the gas inside that piston. Okay. And so we we put heat in there or whatever and it and it expands, it's doing work on the surroundings. If we put energy into the system by cramming that piston down and compressing the gas, then we're doing work on the system and it should be positive. So we can compress a gas, put work into the gas, and now it has higher energy. And that's what we do with a compressor, like an air compressor. We plug it in, turn it on, brrr, what's it doing? It's, it's stuffing more gas into a small volume and the pressure is going up, okay? And so we're, um, we're putting work into that system of gas and now it can do things. It can, it can spin those air tools and, and do work for us. Okay, now we have a different kind of, of uh, <clears throat> expansion. This is reversible isothermal expansion. So here we have isothermal. So iso will say constant for the iso and therm temperature. And so that's this curve right there. That, that curve in a PV diagram is an isotherm. And you can think about the ideal gas law, right? NRT over V, okay? As the volume changes, so the volume's getting bigger, the pressure is getting smaller. So volume goes up, pressure goes down, but we're at a particular temperature. So that's what this diagram is. Now it requires a thermal contact with what we call a thermal ballast or a thermal reservoir, okay, to do this kind of expansion. Because when it's expanding, it's trying to give off heat. And in order to maintain this temperature, it's pulling, pulling temperature, it's pulling heat in from the surroundings to maintain that, that constant temperature. So let's look at the at the work equation in this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to take infinitesimal little steps along this curve. And so our, our small changes in work are related to small changes in volume. So D work is related to dV. This is, you see, this is the similar equation we had before, minus P times delta V. But we're doing this infinitesimal steps. And so we're going to integrate to get the area under this curve, okay? So we're going to integrate um, both sides. We integrate work, well, D, dW becomes W, okay? And we're going to integrate the volume. So from, from V initial to V final, P times delta V, let's take this pressure and put it, put the ideal gas law in for that pressure. Okay, so now we have NRT over V, N's a constant, R's a constant, T's a constant. This is isothermal expansion. So those come out front. So these, these friends come out front. And we have the integral of dV over V. Now, the, you know, you may remember from your calculus class that the integral of dx over x is natural log, okay? And then you evaluate it at the upper limit and subtract the lower limit. So natural log of v final minus the natural log of v initial, the difference in logs is a fraction inside the log. And so that's where this fraction comes from. So the natural log of v final over v initial would be the result of this integral. Pretty simple equation, but now we have an equation for the work if we have an isothermal process. So we had an isobaric expansion, we had an isothermal expansion, two different conditions. So that's the thing that makes this course tricky, is you've got to think, what is the context? Is it isothermal? Is it isobaric? What's, what's the situation? It's not as, as fearful as it, as it needs to be. There'll be I'll, there's some classic problems, and I'll teach you the classic problems. But you should be able to look at the system and go, okay, I can't use that equation for this situation because the context is wrong. So you've got to be able to do that. So let's do a super simple practice here. Calculate the expansion work done when 55.8 grams of iron reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce hydrogen gas in a closed vessel of fixed volume okay, and in an open beaker at 300 Kelvin. Okay, so this is a classic problem that is a trick, okay? A closed vessel 
of fixed volume and you're asking how much expansion work is done. So in this situation, work equals zero because delta V is equal to zero. Make sense? That's a fixed volume. So you get this on some GRE test or whatever. This is, you know, you're sitting there wasting tons of time and you should recognize the condition that, hey, delta V is zero. So it doesn't matter. This is a zero work. And you don't even have to worry about how much iron you have or hydrochloric acid or anything like that. So now, how do we do it in the open beaker? Well, this is solid iron reacting with hydrochloric acid, aqueous. Okay, so this is a liquid. So solid and liquid produces more liquid and then a gas. So this is the thing that's doing the expansion work. This is pushing back against the atmosphere. Now it's in an open beaker, so it's not pushing a piston, but mentally we're pretending there's like a barrier outside of that hydrogen. So if you produce hydrogen, it's gonna push the atmospheric molecules back. And so we can calculate the work done even though we didn't capture it. So we didn't put it in a piston. Maybe we could have, right? Maybe we could use this reaction to push a piston. But if we were and we didn't have any friction or anything like that, we would be able to calculate how much work we could get out of this. So let's go ahead and do that. So uh, how, many, how many moles do we have here? Iron. I picked a good number, right? 55.8. All right, so we've got one mole of iron. And... Is this balanced? So we've got um, iron here and iron there. We've got two chlorides here, and we've got two hydrogens that make a hydrogen, so we've got one mole of this. Okay, so that's not bad. Okay, so V, I, so is in this, this piece right here. How much volume of hydrogen do we have in the reactants? I'm not trying to trick you. It's just zero. There's no hydrogen in the reactants until we generate some, right? So V initial is zero liters. V final, we use the ideal gas law for this, right? Okay, so when this hydrogen expands out, what's it going to expand out to? It's come to one atmosphere pressure because it's being pushed. It's pushing against one atmosphere pressure. So it, it'll be one atmosphere pressure. So we'll go ahead and do one mole times 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And you should have that number memorized just as much as I did just then. <laughs> like, you know. Right away, you know how to put it out there. 298 Kelvin divided by one atmosphere. Okay, so my moles have canceled. My Kelvins have canceled. Notice I'm showing my units. <laughs> What's that? Oh, you're right. 300. Thank you. Thank you. I caught my mistake. Good job, Danny. All right, so we've got that. Let's go ahead and calculate that volume. Yeah, we're gonna run out of time. We're gonna have to like continue these notes into the next lecture because. Okay. All right, 24.6. So this produced 24.6 liters of gas. So it pushes back the atmosphere quite a bit, okay? So now let's calculate the work. Work is equal to minus PEX times VF minus VI. So it's equal to one atmosphere times 24.6 liters or 24.6 liters atmospheres of work. Now that does not look like an energy. That's a liter atmosphere. And so I always show this equation because 
what do you do now? We want to get to joules. So how do we get from this to joules? Well, we could go from atmospheres to pascals, which is newtons per square meter, go from liters to cubic meters and all of that stuff. Yes. 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 So it's, I dropped the negative sign. So it's negative 24.6 liters atmosphere. So it did work on the surroundings. So that's very good. But let me show you a trick on getting out of liters atmospheres and into joules. We have two ideal gas constants memorized. And if not, you need to, okay? I just used this ideal gas constant, right? And what's the other ideal gas constant? The other R that we've talked about and we've used already in the course. Yeah, 8.314. What are the units on that one? Joules per mole of Kelvin. So this, this ratio of ideal gas constants does everything I need it to do. It gets rid of liters atmospheres and turns it into joules and the mole kelvins cancel. And if you look at this ratio, it's 101.325. That's the, actually the defined version of this. Okay. And that is the conversion from atmospheres to Pascal. So it, it is the same mathematically, but this is such an easy way to do it. The ratio of gas constants will get you from liter atmospheres to uh, joules and vice versa. Okay, so we end up with um, multiplying that by 100, roughly. So 24 is negative 24, 60 joules. Okay, so we calculated our first amount of work. That's great. Okay, so next week, or next week's lab is on calorimetry. And so this is a, sort of a little cartoon or a picture of a bomb calorimeter. So it's a, it's a, I don't know why they call it a bomb, because it doesn't explode. In fact, you don't want it to explode but it, it holds on, it's a fixed volume, it's a strong stainless steel container. You have a limit on how much you put in there so that it doesn't explode, okay? So you put a combustible piece, a sample in here, you have to wire it, so you make a little filament wire that touches the sample. You have uh, the firing leads, they come out and you have a little like button that starts it, and then you stuff this full of oxygen. And so you fill it with oxygen so that you're guaranteed to burn all the sample, and then the sample gives off heat. Um, since it's a fixed volume, there's no work, so everything is heat. And so then the heat goes through the walls of the container into the water, and the water temperature rises, and we measure that temperature rise with the thermometer, and we were able to calculate how much heat was released. Okay. And so we have this calorimeter constant that converts the temperature rise into joules, okay? So the calorimeter constant has units of joules per Kelvin. So if the temperature of that water changes a certain degree, then we know how many joules were released from our sample. Uh, we can also use a, a resistive heater, and we'll do that to, uh, on Monday and Wednesday of next week. We'll put a heater in there, and then we'll use the, the, the current I, the voltage V, and the time, delta T, to calculate how many joules it takes to raise, you know, X amount of water so many degrees. Okay. This is the data analysis. So if we have a rapid combustion, this is what it looks like. So if you have your sample in there and you punch the button and it burns really quickly, then you have a quick rise in temperature and then it tapers off. And so where do you pick the delta T? Because if you're out here and you want to calculate the delta T, you know, there's no data point down here. 
there's data points over here. So how do we do this? Well, the ASTM has come up with a procedure. This is the, um, uh, these standards uh, allow us to have a standard way of calculating things. And so this is the, the ASTM standard. What you do is you have this pre-data here before the, the burn, and you have this initial or pre-period where you establish a linear trend. And so you fit this data to a linear trend, and then you extrapolate that data out. Now, you're going to get one that you print off a blackboard, and you're going to do this with a ruler. So that's easy to do. Is you have the printout, you use a ruler, and you draw the line. Okay? And then up here, you have the post period, and you use the ruler, and you draw that line. And you come backwards. Now, where does this vertical line go? Well, you take... You take this distance here and you multiply by 0.63. So 0.63 of the rise. So 63%. So that's what this dashed line is. So this is 63% of the rise. Does everybody understand that? What I mean by the rise? Okay. And where that dashed line intersects the data, you draw this vertical line. And that's the delta T. So this is T final, and this is T initial. So that's how you analyze a thermogram. Okay. We we'll do it by hand, and then I give you a spreadsheet that does it automatically for you. Okay, but I want you to do it by hand first. I didn't have you make this spreadsheet because it, it was tough. <laughs> we have to do a linear regression for the pre-period and a linear regression for the post-period. We have to extrapolate those lines and you have to decide like how many data points to use. If I'm, if I'm using, if I'm counting these data points and then I include this one, then my line is going to be off, right? And if I'm, if I'm calculating the linear regression of this one, the trend line, if you will, and I start including these data points, then my trend line is going to be off. And so you've got to decide how many points in the pre-period and how many points on the post-period. And you can look at the R squared values. So you go 10 points, okay, you got a good R squared, 11 points. And then you get to that 12th point where it started to rise again, your R squared drops. And so then you back up. You say, okay, we're going to use 11 points in the pre-period. And I've got a good R squared value for the pre-period or the T initial line. Then you do the post-period and you start coming back. And, you know, depending on how long you let the calculation run, you know, this might be 50 points. You, know, you get to 56, 57, 58, you get to 59 and your R squared starts to move. And you're like, no, I don't want that. So you back up to 57 and you've got a good regression for your uh, T final line. And then once you have those set, then the the rest is automatic and you have a delta T number. So you can pull that off the spreadsheet. But I want you to do it by hand first so that you get a feel for, for how, it, how it works. The resistive heater is not a steep rise. Here you plug everything in, you turn on the power strip and the heat just, you see the temperature just start going up in a, in a linear manner. Okay. But this is how you would apply that ASTM analysis to the resistive heater. Okay. Let's let's zoom in on this this area right in here in the middle, and we've got a couple of minutes. We'll be able to do this. So this area right here in the middle. If we zoom in on that, look how nice and linear it is. So we've got a current of two and a half amps going into our heater, and the voltage we measure on the line voltage is 120 volts, and the mass of the water that we have in the calorimeter is 480 grams. We can do a regression of that line, and we get a slope of 0.1477 and an intercept. The intercept we're not really interested in. We want to know this slope because that's how many degrees C or degrees Kelvin is changing for, for every second. Now our power is the current times the voltage. So the current times the voltage is 300 joules per second. And our slope is Kelvin per second. And so the ratio of those, the per seconds cancel, and we've got our calorimeter constant. So it takes 2,031 joules for every degree Kelvin to go into the system. 
Now, what's the specific heat of the fluid, the water? So if we have that many joules per Kelvin and we divide by the 480 grams of water, then it's 4.28 joules per gram of water per Kelvin. Okay. What if we wanted the heat capacity? Well, we want to get out of grams of water and go into moles. And so if we multiply that by 18 grams per mole, we get 76.2 joules per mole of water. And our literature values are pretty darn close to that. So that's pretty cool. We, the specific heat, again, specific is always per mass. Um, and uh, so the specific heat is 4.184 joules per gram of water and the heat capacity of water is 75. Why is it higher? Well, it's a higher because we have glass in there. It's in, a, it's in a container. It's not water in isolation. Okay. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's, we're out of time. So we will pick up with the calculations for next week's lab on Monday, which is perfect timing for those people who are starting. So, but you can look ahead in the notes and, and see what we're, what we're going to be doing. All right. I'll see you next time.